life in three dimensions got me bent and got me twisted. I know I'd upset a lot, but I should probably stop pretending. I don't really hold the key and I can't really push a button. I just step up to the mic and try my very best to bust it, but I ran out of breath. It's tight in my chest. My feet just might fail. I can't stand up. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Racially Speaking, where we have real and honest conversations about race as it's viewed through the lens of faith, family, and vocation. As always, I'm your host, David Phipps, and um, no John Mark today, um, but rest assured, um, worry not, I am joined by another good friend, um, old friend, much younger and better looking than me, but old friend because we had not seen each other in, um, man, far too long. So I'm extra thankful for for Zoom that we can just uh, Zoom him into where he spent uh a lot of has he where he spent a lot of his life um on this side of the world i guess you're not from the other side of the world but anyway we'll get into that um, i'm joined by my good friend sam taylor um sam thanks for being here i always butcher the intros man so i want you to introduce yourself cool. you wear a lot of hats so tell our listeners a little bit about who you are um specifically trying to hit on faith, family, and vocation. And we're obviously going to unpack all of those a little bit. So thanks for being here, man. Yeah, David, thanks. Thanks. It's, um, yeah, it's really an honor to, to, to be on. Um, yeah, as David said, um, old friends, I am originally from the UK. I was born in, in, in London, uh, grew up there until I was 18. And I moved to the States to Radford, um, in 2014. Um, I played, uh, tennis at Radford. I was on tennis scholarship. Um, and through that, um, I got involved with Athletes in Action and crew and a uh, local church and really came to faith in in um, in Radford. So, mm. yeah, so that that's awesome. Um, so, yeah, tennis first. And then I realized I didn't want to leave Radford. So I applied to their master's program in communication and did my master's there in strategic communication um, and got some experience doing some graduate teaching um, alongside kind of after tennis kind of finished and then I realized I enjoyed teaching and I applied to do my PhD um, to a few programs and I got in at Ohio University in Athens Ohio and that's where I am now I'm yeah I'm in my third year Uh, I finished my comprehensive exams yesterday oh man Um, has it been three years already oh my gosh yeah two and a half years I moved here in the summer of 2020 okay Uh, peak COVID what a summer and uh, what else is going on? Uh, I recently got married um, six months ago, <laughs> uh, Emily, and yesterday we got a puppy. Yeah, I was gonna say first and foremost, I saw you got a puppy. Let's let's, let's see her. Her, yeah. Oh She's my black. gosh, She's a black lab, and she is um, yeah, wrecking our world a little bit. But you said she doesn't know her name yet, Coda. But- she doesn't have a clue what's going on. She just wants oh food my gosh. and toys and yeah, all that stuff. So, <laughs> shout out, shout out to uh, join our Patreon. This is a great, uh, a great opportunity for me. So, if you're listening and you can't and you want to see a puppy, you can join our Patreon and you'll have the full episode to look at the puppy for a little bit. Yeah. Um, bring her anyway. back. In. Yeah, she's yeah bring her back in. We'll give her. her we'll give her a segment. <laughs> So you literally just got got, got her yesterday? Yeah. Well, well, we knew we were going to get her. Right. Um, but as I said, I had my comprehensive exams last Friday and then on Monday. So as soon as I was done um, with, with writing, we went and picked her up from Sunbury, Ohio, just the other side of Columbus. So about an hour and a half from, from Athens. And uh, yeah, now she's a new member of the FAP. So. Wow. So... Quick side note, I still stand by this. I've got two kids, another on the way. Potty training our dog was so much worse to me. Yeah, we so, literally, literally 10 minutes ago had our first accident, but we had a yeah. puppy pad down, so okay. not, not terrible. Um, I was going to say, you're um, you're going to be in full swing for a little bit. Yeah. Because with Probably. kids, with kids, you, they have diapers. So, I mean, it's not fun, but at least uh, initially... You got that to help you dogs, man. I just, it was so stressful to watch our dog run around and not know, you know, if I couldn't see him for a second, where's he at? 
Yeah, it's no, no, no. I've only been married six months, so no, no, I don't know the kids, <laughs> no kids yet, but what yeah, yeah. in the future, but maybe, hopefully. Well, if, if yeah. kids are in your future, then re- remember this conversation. So okay. be, right. be comforted by it. Um, <laughs> if, if you take away nothing else from this conversation. Um, all right. Great intro. Much better job than I would do. Um, so you're up in Athens, Ohio. Yeah. I want to start here first and then we're going to get into maybe some, uh, a little more fun stuff. So, um, look, you, there's so much I want to ask you, like, what was it like your first taste of the States living in little old Radford? But anyway, we'll skip over that for now. Okay. You're, you're up in, um, Athens, Ohio, working on a PhD in communication. I already have a couple of degrees in communication. So you're passionate about the topic. Um, specifically, you know, man, I'm having you on because of, um, I was already, I already wanted to have you on, but you specifically reached, reached out or we, I think it was DMs or whatever. And we were conversing about something going on and you're, what you're studying, or at least a paper you were working on is really right in the wheelhouse of things we talk about here sure. on the yeah. podcast. So can you talk a little bit about kind of where your focus is right now and, um, the paper specifically, it was, it was a while back that you were in the midst of working on um, yeah. mm-hmm. and maybe how, how that went. Yeah. So if, it, if it's the paper that um, I'm thinking of, it was last semester, I was taking a, a methods course in content analysis, which basically like counting various things. Anyway, our, um, my specific area of research that I'm interested in is religious communication. Um, and I can get into that a bit more, but yeah. for this specific project, we were looking at the January 6th, capital insurrection uh 2021 mm. and, um um basically looking for ties between that and christian nationalism the presence um, or the co-presence um of of these symbols of potentially christian nationalism um and various other things and the way that we looked for that was in mainstream and leading christian news sources so we took um which often, which are because that can that can mean a lot of things. So yeah, so so we looked at um, online articles from um, the two kind of sides. We looked at Fox News and CNN. Okay, so we okay. looked at we took a bunch of articles um, immediately following. So in the January, the rest of that month of 2021, from CNN and from um, and from Fox News, um, and looked at and looked at the, the content of those for um, how blame was re- um, kind of responsibility was attributed along with um were there any symbols or mentions of christianity what was the or christians and how were they implicated were they held as responsible etc cetera, etc cetera. so looking at them across the two kind of um news sources and then the third the third one was looking at christian um reportings of january 6 right so we looked at okay. we took articles from christianity today uh christian headlines and a third one, which is evading me. I can't remember what it was. Okay. So we, look, we looked at articles from the January right after in 2021. And then we took articles a year later. Um, so in the January slash February of 2022 and okay. kind of compared, we created um, like a code book. And this isn't, this isn't my method of wheelhouse, like what I kind of lean towards, but for the purpose of this class, this is what we did and kind of looked at, see what the difference was, was between a year apart right how was how did the right or the conservative news fox news how did that um assign responsibility and and the role of christianity or christian nationalism in it and likewise from the left from cnn a more kind of liberal news source mm-hmm. and then and then from the christian sources as well so it okay. was really interesting what um i mean obviously i want to know what you found but what do you mean the difference? Like, that's an interesting, I don't think I would naturally think that that's what you would be looking at with that specific topic. So like, I would just assume that like a CNN and a Fox news, yeah, not much would have changed based on what their intentions are or which way they're leaning. I mean, wh- yeah. what did you expect to find or why is that the angle you went with? Um, well, we were really looking at kind of the co-presence. This is a bit I missed out. It's the co-presence of Christian nationalism and violence. Okay. So looking yeah, okay. um, of how kind of these were framed 
um, were there was Christian nationalism and violence kind of in the same place? Was it being was there a link between them kind of thing? Um, but the interesting okay. thing was over. So the ones that were immediately following the January, the, the event, it was the, the attribution was. There was a lot of different responsibility, m- mostly kind of like Trump supporters um, or if, if it was um, trying to minimize responsibility, it was like, well, these aren't like this is un-American or this is trying to shift the blame, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but mainly speaking, there was an agreement between CNN or Fox News that, yes, one, this was violent um, and two, it was largely Trump supporters that that were doing this however the interesting thing was between cnn and fox news is that there was a very very little mention of christian nationalism if at all in these, from in from, range, from either from both okay yeah um, obviously the christian sources would speak about were the ones that were speaking more about christian nationalism and the implications of christians response you know from regarding uh the, the insurrection but yeah, it was it was strange to, that we didn't really see much co-presence of Christian nationalism and violence from either side. Responsibility came up, but not so much what we thought we were going to find. Okay, it, uh, interesting that there was that um, common ground. Seems to put it a little bit too yeah. amicably, but maybe common ground on that the Christian nationalism and link yeah. towards violence wasn't necessarily yeah that, present that, present. Yeah, yeah, that was that was in the 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 first set. So in the jan- in the immediate response. However, the year the the interesting thing from if we if we kind of move forward after our first kind of draft of this paper was that the year later the conservative news sources were really blaming the left basically and um, minimizing responsibility. How so? So what would the what would their angle look like? What would that coin look like that is the left side? Um, like blaming Biden and Kamala Harris, right? Because they compared it to like Pearl, Pearl Harbor and various other events. And basically just instead of taking responsibility that they were ba- basically blaming the left that um, it should, you know, it wasn't as bad as it seemed or. Yeah. So for the kind of the minimization of the responsibility from these conservative sources, it was it was blaming Democrats, right? Blaming Joe Biden, blaming Kamala Harris and and um, some of these, you know, Fox pundits like Tucker Carlson. A lot of the articles yeah. were like from him, right? Who, in my opinion, is like. So can you. Worst. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, can you. So dumb it down for somebody like me. Um, sure. What would um, just what what is what is the angle? Because I think I mean, as you found out in your research that you mm-hmm. said it was mainly Trump supporters responsible for supporting and literally um, mm-hmm. walking out the insurrection and stuff. I think that's objective truth. So what would the angle be to blame Democrats? And I'm not again trying to take a side or be political. I think people listening know what quote unquote side I would be on, but either way, like what is, what is there to blame on, you know, you have former, you know, president Trump on camera and recorded everything, you know, Mm -hmm. encouraging this to take place, encouraging all of this to happen. Yeah. So what is there to blame on Biden and and Harris? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Um, I think the the important piece is the fact that it was mostly kind of like the one year anniversary, right? So the one year anniversary came up January of the insurrection. Okay. Yeah. January 2022. And we're collecting those. This is where the shift happened in terms of the responsibility. So uh, immediately there was somewhat of an agreement, right? That it was mainly people, you know, all the pictures in these articles, it was Trump memorabilia everywhere, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at the at the pictures from CNN and Fox, however, the year later, in January 2022, when when news sources were reviewing, like okay, the insurrection one year later, the change happened where the Fox Fox and the conservative um, media were 
minimizing responsibility. So saying, blame, blaming the left or, or other, I mean, we looked at, I think we looked at over 150 articles, right? So in, in looking at the content of those. So it was, it was less and not all of them, right? But there was a majority. We, we had statistical significance that basically said that, um, the, the right were minimizing responsibility one year later, uh, compared to, in the immediate aftermath okay does that, does that make sense or am i getting that yeah i mean i i i think it makes sense that they would minimize their responsibility especially once a year has gone past and figure out ways to blame the other side because that's what minimizing responsibility is but i genuinely and i mean this genuinely not i'm not looking for an answer or to sound um patronizing to somebody that might you know lean right but mm-hmm what like what is the main claim like how could someone blame the democrats or president biden or harris for the insurrection happening like is there something yeah. to stand on you know what i mean like what yeah, is, well, i genuinely what is there to say yeah it it's more like sh- reframing it shifting it not necessarily saying that you know biden or harris were explicitly responsible for it but mm-hmm. uh, various other things twist kind of you know reframing it twisting it if you will um yeah and just generally i'd have to look at it again um in a bit more detail but yeah it was it was a really it was a really interesting and hard project and content analysis and like more stats and quantitative data is not really my wheelhouse okay Um, i'm i'm more of a qualitative guy that likes to do interviews and talk to people and um, in my in my own, I was working in a team in, on this certain project, so I was not along for the ride, uh, but I was like the third, uh, the third author on the paper. If, 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 if gotcha. that makes sense. So okay, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so on that note, so like maybe let's move a little bit more into where you like to camp out um, sure. with talking to people, or almost like the paper you're just talking about. We've already been talking about what. Um, I mean this affectionately like so what meaning like yeah. from that paper like what can readers or listeners right now take away from what you guys discovered so like why does that matter in a sense of progress or mm-hmm. yeah moving forward and I'm of course going to move you a little bit more into where some overlap is so like uh cultural and social justice and the racial implications obviously mm-hmm. I think is is interconnected in there somewhere, whether it's with Christian nationalism, mm-hmm. the motive behind something like the insurrection. And yeah, you know, we didn't intend I didn't intend to camp out just on the insurrection yeah. or anything, but like more the more of the two agendas. So I would say that something like the insurrection or even just the polarization of um Democrats, Republicans and politics overall race justice stuff like that is a big is the most one of the most polarizing things and i think there's a lot of overlap with that so where like one why is this and as it relates to like what you're studying communication wise i'm not asking you to be a political expert but why has this happened and like why are we still I think kind of in the same place, like we're on the heels of another election coming up. And it seems like, um, you know, after a year like 2020, Mm -hmm. even like I, we don't even have to go all the way back to 2015, but like 2020, when it seems like everyone's kind of become enlightened. And I think there's one narrative that's, Oh, things, you know, since George Floyd or since 2020 and COVID, all this stuff, like we're healing now and like we're moving towards, progress like that the silver lining of all this polarization is that um we're more aware of stuff and stuff's changing i don't i think data shows i like i don't think that's actually happening if that makes sense i think we're not moving enough past enlightenment if that makes sense like awareness i think statistics show like the statistics that just came out about 2022 police have killed more um people especially black and brown people than ever before there's a lot of nuance in that, but something like that happening with people thinking that things have changed since George Floyd, since 2020 is, you know, I think one of the biggest dangers to progress. 
yeah. because that's literally not the case. Like the opposite has happened. So something's not working. I'm not saying I have all the answers, but something isn't working. All the money we donated, all the TED mm-hmm. talks we hosted, all the podcasting we've been doing. It's like, what's, what, what, you know, what's the point? And I kind of want to, yeah. ha- I have that mentality a little bit right now as well. Of like what, if this is what has happened since all of that, like, why are we still in this, um, state of not moving moving forward i have a lot to say about that as you can imagine yeah. but it's, as far as you're concerned it's hard, isn't it? yeah it's i i don't i don't have it, the answers either um mm-hmm. and it's yeah when i when i think about it on a on a macro level right and especially given my own identities right like as a as a white male um it's hard to think, you know, why, why have we not made any progress? Or if we have, have we really, um, you know, when I started at OU, it was, it was right after, um, the murder of George Floyd, right. One of the first papers Mm -hmm. I wrote was about, was about George Floyd and CrossFit, (laughs) right. Um, okay. How the, the CrossFit CEO at the time tweeted it's Floyd 19, right. Mocking, covid and the death of floyd or, or and covid and the death of george floyd right one of the and who was the uh, where, where was that tweet his name was greg glassman right he tweeted um, okay. he he tweeted it's floyd oh, the, the big crossfit guy yeah he was the he said he's the guy who started it right so right okay i remember all that happening yeah gotcha. so then after that there was a whole you know basically the whole like organization almost fell apart athletes were you know, dropping Mm -hmm. out left, right and center. And, um, yeah. yeah, And now what, 2023, um, I think, yeah, I don't know. It's hard. I I don't know on a big scale. All I know is that where I'm at, um, and what I can control is how am I, um, engaging in, in these difficult conversations when I'm teaching in the classroom, um, with my students, with my friends, colleagues and the work that I'm doing, um, how am I keeping this conversation going? You know. Um, okay, so yeah, how are you? How are you doing that on the day on the daily? If you're just worrying about yourself, like how? What part are you playing with keeping these conversations going? Yeah. Um, so one of my favorite things about what I do is the fact I get to teach, um, right? And and as a communication doctoral student, everyone has to teach public speaking, right? So um, first years are always teaching public speaking. So you're getting these often first or second year students doing to think about topics that are meaningful to them. Um, they might not, might not be directly related to, to race, but it's often a social issue. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and oftentimes it is, it can be linked to, to race that's in public speaking. Um, the other class where I explicitly speak about white privilege and, and race is intercultural communication or at OU it's called communication among cultures. Um, okay. And in this class, we we talk about like, um, yeah, being self reflexive or looking at your own privilege, right? A lot, a lot of these kids are from wealthy suburbs of Cleveland or Columbus, right? Who have never had to question um, anything. And this is, you know, high and mighty. I, I'm in the same boat, right? White, uh, kind of middle class, and um, so being aware of my own privilege and. And getting students to think about that is um, kind of what that class is all about. So how um, do you, uh, so how do you, um, how do you present stuff like that as awkward as it could be for a white male to bring up who's an authority, like in a classroom, to bring up something that white privilege do? Like how do students respond, and how do you navigate not pushback? I mean, I want to hear that, but also like the awkwardness of just being able to talk about it. And I ask that because. Yeah. I think I think right now I can see the the trend right now seems to be moving away from using any kind of that language, like even more so. Yeah. Like I think I mean it's literally stuff like that's being like outlawed in places like Florida. And yeah. Um and in schools. So mm-hmm. that's another conversation. But how are you leaning into that awkwardly but confidently? Um you know, without without it coming off as maybe inauthentic, yeah. but also not you're an ex, you know, you're an expert in that setting specifically, but also not, not coming off as too much of an expert. Cause I, yeah. I assume you have white and black students 
mm-hmm. in your in your courses, um, yeah. Hispanic, maybe Asian. But um, yeah, just what what is the overall like feeling in the classroom um, yeah. when you're bringing up stuff like that? Yeah, so this past summer, um, I got the opportunity to teach a, a summer section, a summer course. Course it was only six and a half weeks. Um, it kind of sprung up out of nowhere, and it was basically created for the incoming student athletes. It's one of the reasons I got chosen because I was like, well, I've taught this co- course before, and yeah. I can maybe relate to some of these these students. Um, and the whole class out of thirty students, um, I think fifteen or sixteen were freshman football players. Um, I think 10 were men's basketball. There was one women's basketball and like three non-athletes in the class, something like that. Okay. Right. Yeah. So this class was basically, and, and in terms of diversity, I would say it was, um, 75% BIPOC. Right. So it was, yeah. People okay. of color con- consisted of like the majority, way over the majority of the class. Yeah. Okay. So in, in six and a half weeks, um, how did I kind of address these issues as as a as a white male, right, in a position of? Um, but how do I relate to them as as a previous student athlete, right? And um, we had some good conversations, and there were some white students from rural Ohio who who would push back. Um, so it's kind of just, and you could see sometimes there was tension between the teammates in the class, right? But generally speaking, they were willing to kind of be reflexive and think about their own lives um Mm. and one of the cool things about this class is that because it was a such a six and a half week seven week i got to kind of design it a little bit and i I had them watch um movies on on and they had to include quotes from the movies in their final paper um which movies uh, yeah i'll be watched um slumdog millionaire um okay. bend, it, bend it like beckham if anyone that has knows bend <laughs> okay. it like beckham. Uh, it's about football or soccer in england about yeah. a young Sikh girl and looking at it from that perspective there was that there's this one with ludicrous in from like 2005 what's it called it's really intense um uh crash crash yeah yeah i had them back yeah yeah fantastic uh, movie yeah so they they watched the whole of that and I mean, this was three days a week for two hours a day, right? Because it was an intense course. So on the mm. third day, after we kind of done lecture and activities, it was movie day and it was Crash, Slumdog Millionaire, Bend It Like Beckham, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. I had them watch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's an about- eclectic, uh, eclectic group of movies. That's, yeah. Great yeah. Picks. There was another one as well that was um, um, about, it was, it's that guy's in Japan. Um, I can't remember what it's called now, but, um, so yeah, that, that was one cool, that was one of my favorite experiences teaching. Cause I got to engage with these students. Um, did they as, have to do, a, yeah. Did they have to do any self-reflection like afterwards? Like, did you see by the end that, did you feel good? And I'm not trying to say how, yeah. like, did you do a good job, Sam? But like, did you feel like, okay, I think, you know, perspectives of across the board yeah. were for the positive. Yeah, I would say their final papers, right? They had to take cl- class concepts such as, um, right, ethnocentrism, right? Seeing seeing culture from your own, your own, you know, understanding, right? Viewing your own mm-hmm. culture as superior compared to others. Um, so maybe they tied that to an example from um, one of the movies we watched, right? Or personal examples in their own life they could use use personal examples and tie it to class concepts. And, and I did see that in their final final papers and. Um, that's great yeah it was meaningful to me because i remember seeing a football player like this offensive lineman at the gas station like after the class had finished and like you mm-hmm. know he saw me and came dap me up and like yeah it's cool. <laughs> got to uh, you know uh form some relationships um like i don't normally run in circles as football players um sure. yeah. so what about last question on this part what um did you feel like the white students specifically that were maybe given a little bit of pushback, even if it was just in in their body language, even did you feel like by the end they they were in step with you a little more? Or yeah, did you feel yeah. like they were still pushing back? I mean, I'm not gonna change someone's complete uh, or my goal right. is to change someone's complete, you know, or persuade them in six and a half weeks. But yeah, I think that they saw where I was coming from and where the how the class and the textbook were used. 
um, I think they appreciated it. Um, even if they still held on to their own convictions or, you know, if, if you're from rural Ohio and you're from a real small town, smaller than, you know, um, somewhere like Radford, it's going and you haven't been exposed to diversity at all. It's going to be pretty difficult. Um, but I think, yeah, some awareness and reflexivity were the main kind of skills in, in that class, which is, I think, really valuable. Okay. Yeah, man. Okay. That sounds, that sounds fantastic. I wish, um, I'm jealous of you teaching overtly about that stuff in the classroom. I, I touch on it some, but in my classrooms, I don't, you know, get, I don't get, um, to teach, um, cause it's not expertise as far as like what, you know, what you're studying, but, um, that quite as explicitly, um, which is a blessing and a curse. Like I do wish I did, I could do it sometimes, but then other times I'm glad not to have to go down yeah. those, those roads, um, in all of the hats I wear. So, um, yeah, that, that sounds great. Um, all right. Can you talk a little bit about, um, I've written down here with, uh, your journey with your faith, with Christianity from moving from the UK. Yeah deciding to you know pursue jesus um you found you know a local church here in radford all while navigating american christian culture at the same time because th- you yeah. came from not that culture to in this culture and then like you said you're living through one of the most polarizing times ever and then would you like put a little bit of a bow on it and say like give us give us man you're the phd guy so like give us some advice like what is missing in your opinion like how can we move the needle and move past some of this? And I'm asking you to speak a little bit collectively, like, Mm -hmm. and it can be your personal experience mixed in with your academic studies of, okay, where like you've mentioned nationalism or Christian nationalism. We've touched on politics, um, the classroom, stuff like that. Like, what do you think is your elevator pitch for solving where we're at? (laughs) Uh, um yeah um so yeah all right well i'll start off with moving to radford right um moving from suburban london southeast london as an 18 year old to rural southwest virginia um was quite the culture shock right um i was shocked by the presence and the remnants of um racially speaking of slavery right i was of mm. of segregation right there um are predominantly white fraternities at radford and predominantly um african-american or bipoc um you know organizations right and i could i sensed this this tension that i had never experienced before right so you um, had that was very different than where you grew up yeah you're saying okay yeah extremely different um so navigating. We're good. Sorry, I don't mean yeah. keep interrupting you. So I want to. Do you mean different um, in a sense of you weren't exposed to a very diverse, very diverse circles, or different in that you were around diverse circles and there wasn't that tension? Yeah, that I was. That, you, okay. you know, in England, in, in sorry, in London specifically, it's extremely diverse, right? Very. Um, like my elementary school and my the school that I went to um, prior was really diverse and. Um, I mean, there's diversity in Southwest Virginia, but it's just how the social groups um, kind of clung together was th- was diff- completely different that I hadn't mm-hmm. I hadn't experienced before, or the demographics, I should say. Um, so that was gotcha. uh, that was eye opening in terms of um, in terms of race and, and demographics, and then in terms of Christianity, right? Um, that shook me as well right from going to cook out where you've got bible verses on your takeaway cup to um explicitly christian um churches on, on every corner i never the thing that aia or athletes in action was so um so why i got involved was i'd never experienced that you know the tagline of we talk about god life and sport right with with people who are fellow athletes i'd never experienced that before i was just you know tennis that was it there was no um yeah that was really appealing to me um and then crew getting involved with crew and and vbc 
um, and the relationships that I built through those organizations were, were, were um, really kind of what led me to, to Christ and um, my relationship with it, with him now. Um, yeah. Yeah. So what was it? That was great. What was it like? Um, Cause I think this can inform where we're at right now navigating your faith journey, which was a positive thing um, with, um, and maybe you didn't feel this at all until more, more recently after the fact um, of getting involved, but navigating um, the positivity of you coming to know, know Christ and Christianity at the same time as the entering into the polarized culture that we're, we've been talking yeah. about um, with, and I'm just going to assume like, is it, is it fair to say that you're in your understanding Christianity um, it's fair to criticize the role that historically and, and recently some that oh, yeah. Christianity has played a role for the worse in, um, in all of this. So well, I don't know what was it like to experience both at the same time of like the freedom and the life changing journey it is of deciding to follow Jesus while also critiquing the negative side of it all at the same time. Cause I think that's just, that's very interesting to me mm-hmm. um, to hear what you would say, because I think that in the midst of polarization, people, most people would say they're on one side or the other on that. Yeah. Uh, or at least not sorry not most people but it can i think more people are in your spot but because of polarization all we hear about and see is that oh everyone you know all the left-leaning people are leaving church and then all the right-leaning people are oppressing everybody and it's there's nothing in between and i think there is a lot more in between but we want to disengage and not talk about that and i do see why that is but also i i'm just i'm not wired that way i got to talk about it so Mm-hmm. what was that like for you or still is yeah so um i didn't really i think i'm gonna go and say that i think radford is a bit of a bubble right um mm-hmm. where i was surrounded with so many people that affirmed my faith and built me up and are some of the most my closest friends that i didn't really have to question um, especially given my identities, right? However, when I moved to when I moved out of Radford to Ohio and started this this intensive doctoral program, I started to question and and continue to 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 deconstruct. Um, even in the church that I'm a part of now, right? Like when I was searching for churches, it's been um, when I moved here. Um, I had I went to one church for a little while and and left because. I couldn't, they weren't meeting me, you know, I, I'm in this super liberal left-leaning um, doctoral program. And then I was going to this uh, non-domina- non-dominational, basically white evangelical church. And it was around the 2020 election and I wanted okay. to have these conversations yeah. and no one was meeting me in the middle. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Come on, give me, so- give me something, okay. yeah. give me something. And, and, um my dis- my dissertation topic which is moving away from january 6 but is the uh the main topic is the millennial disidentification with uh christianity in america mm. um, so that's what i'm that's what i'm really interested in it's- there we go yeah so main topic is the millennial so folks born from 81 to 96 is the kind of window um, cause according to Pew, Pew research, that is the demographic that is leaving and, and exodusing, if you will. Um, 18 to 26, you said, sorry, 80 born between 1981 and 19, oh, uh, yeah, 1981 and 1996 millennial. Okay. Basically millennial. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Disidentifying, leaving, exiting, um, and that's not just like, I'm talking about people that we both know who were, were in crew with us right mm-hmm. who, uh, or with me my my year groups um some of my close or uh, who were close friends who uh no longer claim jesus right mm, um, yeah so it's per- it's personally affects me so that's one of the reasons why i'm doing this because um it's not just something that's happening in society it's it's happening yeah. in my in my reality right with Absolutely. people i care about so um 
So where, how does that, that's great. Appreciate you sharing that. And listeners apologize if there was a, we had a cut out for a second. I think we picked up where we had left off, but apologies. Um, it informs you personally. I very much uh, um, agree with that. And we literally have overlapping um, circles where that's true for both of us. So where do you, that's great to hear some of your personal motivation mm-hmm. as you've been going down those trails. Like where do you find yourself with, um, I don't know, day to day navigating people's views of how you identify yourself. Um, yeah. Somebody has never met you and, you know, you bring up your faith and your church affiliation, Christianity and your studies. Like, where do you, um, I don't know. Is there anything, cause we're talking about polarization. Is there anything that first you could speak to that is maybe unfair one side or the other of things are out there? Cause I mean, we have stuff like, you know, cancel culture or just anti-social media in general is like people think are the, is the answer. Um, you know, mm-hmm. gotcha journalism is, is the reason for all of this. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'm trying to figure out how to more eloquently put that, but yeah. Is there anything I, that's I, just like, okay, this is not actually what is happening. Mm-hmm. This is what's happening instead or the other side of things where you would just say, yeah, all this is fair. And here we are. Yeah. Um, I, the way that I can kind of speak to that is more kind of in, in my studies, uh, or in, in, in academia. Right. Um, you know, during my first year, I was like, everyone here hates Christians, right? Everyone here, um, hate is a strong word, but there is, what you're saying. Christianity is, you know, it is frowned upon. It's oppressive. Um, it's, um, telling people that they can't be true to themselves, whatever that means, right? Um, or can't live the life that they, um, you know, lots of identity things. And I, I can go into that. So, and truth and questioning truth in, in, in everything. Um, so that was really, really hard for me during kind of my first year here of like, I'm a Christian in a space where Christianity, where it is not, not only welcomed, but like really looked upon negatively. Um, mm-hmm. But as I've kind of grown or over the last kind of two and a half years, I've realized that there are Christians in academia, right? There, mm-hmm. there are people that, that love Jesus that um, are in, are in public university institutions, right? And like the pair of us are, you know, we're examples of that. Right. Um, so it's not, it's not as black and white as it may seem. There are, you have to kind of get into some of that messiness and kind of find, like seek people to, to kind of rest, explain that you're struggling. You know, I'm in this, I'm in this program where I feel like, um, you know, people don't view my faith negatively um but that sometimes is not just the case like i'm very fortunate that my uh my advisor goes to the same church as me right um as did my advisor oh, wow. at, at radford <laughs> um okay. so like if you there are people out there and there are um there are organizations like the religious communication association which is interfaith but they all their work is about religious communication or there's the um christian communication scholars network ccsn where group of christians who are also communication people um you know share research or books or just community so um yeah the idea that the that that academia is like really anti-christian or anti-religion just in general um is not necessarily always true Okay. Yeah, that's helpful. That's good. Um, all right. Last question on this. We'll take a quick break, but um, I want to end on a racially speaking type question. Yeah. So how would you advise um, people listening to engage with um, 
racial conversations, um, meaning trying to put this all together. So how would you say to, um, yeah. Okay. How would you advise listeners, which are listeners, which are largely Christians, not all, um, that listen here, a lot of people we know, a lot of people we don't, um, to engage with racial justice issues and just be confident in doing that. If they're, especially if they're passionate about learning and seeing change as far as race goes. And I'm not trying to elevate, but we only care about racial justice, no other social justice issues. It's quite the opposite. Actually, we care. It's all interconnected. I'm very big with how interconnected everything is, but I'm also convicted in a sense of race is just almost always the exception where people pump the brakes and say, Oh, we're not, well, you know, let's not, let's not go there. I can get behind, you know, caring for the orphan or, even sometimes, you know, caring for, um, um, women's rights, which I advocate for as well, but, you know, just race historically is just always, in my opinion, the one that where people pump the brakes. And so how, how would you advise people to just confidently, especially share the same faith as us engage with racial conversations without being afraid of, Oh, I don't, I don't want to be associated with, you know, um, the, abortion conversation or, um, you know, um, uh, LGBTQ, mm-hmm. um, IA conversations and stuff like those conversations are all valuable, but how to not have deer in the headlights. If something like race and having conversations comes up. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, it does. Um, cause I think you're doing this. Yeah. I, and it's like, I, th- there is no, there is no one formula, right? There is, you are going to, and I think that speaks to some of like what that, is it uh, white fragility, right? Um, is it Robin mm-hmm. D'Angelo? Yeah. Right? We are scared of making mistakes or putting our foot in our mouths. And I think we have to get over that. And that is, that is hard. Um, and like me entering into a classroom where I'm talking about these things like white privilege or, um, kind of being reflexive about our own privileges as as whatever that may be is is difficult and it takes courage but um in terms of how do you do that from a christian standpoint especially as 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 a white person who is you know i would say that i care deeply right about um racial justice and but how do i go about and do that honestly I, i don't know i just try and you know in my day-to-day relationships with people try and you know love them how how you know jesus tells me to love them and uh, Mm. that is that is that is that a a a cop-out answer i think well to be fair i think it can be yeah often is but i don't i don't think that that is why you are personally saying it right now because of the conversations and because i know you but the conversation we're having now of that is the answer Mm mm-hmm but it's used in a, I think often a license to not have the conversation. Um, But I I think that's great. I think it's a great answer. I think white fragility is, you know, beyond the book, but it, to me, it's hilarious that, you know, nowadays we can't, that's like a a term we're not allowed to say. And that, you know, literally people are using, trying to legislate that we can't even use that, you know, that book or those texted words. And to me, it's just, it, it's hysterical to me that, um, you know, literally case in point for that book coming out, you know, everyone yeah. read it over the last years and that, you know, white, it's called white fragility yeah. and the response now three years or whatever, how long it's been later is, yeah, yeah, that's too much. We, we can't, we can't handle that. Yeah, so anyway, one, I think that's, yeah. One thing that I just thought of is, um, is one thing that, that, that is part of the communication among cultures courses, like, this idea that colorblindness is is extremely problematic right like yeah. saying oh well i don't see race all right or yeah. this colorblind mentality needs to be um needs to stop right difference matters right there's a book by uh, brenda allen brenda j allen she's like a real big she she writes textbooks for for this course and the textbook's called difference matters right and like being able to view your um, brothers and sisters of color, right, as, 
you know, and affirming their identity, not saying, oh, well, you know, we're, we're just the same because we're not yeah. the same. Um, yeah. So seeing people as different and, and not running away from difference, whether that's, you know, that can be anything. Um, and that's, I think is, a, is a really something that I try to, uh, embody in, in yeah. my interactions is, is, yeah, I'm different from you and, I can learn from you. You can learn from me or whatever that looks like, but embracing difference rather than, rather than being afraid of it, I think is uh, one way that you can kind of try yeah. and do that. That's great. Yeah. It's fantastic. Uh, finding the balance of appreciating diversity mm-hmm. all the time and not conveniently saying, well, aren't we all the same when it's convenient? Um, yeah. Oh, we're all, you know, we're all, um brothers and sisters in christ for sure Mm -hmm. yep there is you know the thing that makes that so beautiful is the fact that we are all different Um, yeah what about the verses about the body of christ and you know the appendages you know Mm -hmm. someone has to be an arm everyone's not the heart and appreciating that diversity anyway i we could obviously keep going on this let's take a quick break and we'll come back with with a little bit more yeah This episode is brought to you by our newly established Patreon. Look, if this podcast has been beneficial to you or someone you know at any point, or you simply just have a few extra dollars that you don't know what to do with, we invite you in to join our Patreon for as low as $1 a month. Look, every single dollar right now is literally going towards an amazing cause. That is not code for... Give us some money so that we can put it into our pockets and figure out what to do with it later. No, seriously, assuming that all of our equipment is not going to just break overnight, literally all of the money right now is going towards helping us give money to first-generation BIPOC college students to help purchase their textbooks each semester. As both of us hold, as both John Mark and I hold several jobs in the college space, in university settings, um, this cause is just really, really very aligned with our heart for the podcast. Um, although we are starting small, we really believe that the importance of generational change and education is a perfect way to launch this Patreon and this endeavor. So look, if this is something you are down with, please go over to patreon.com slash racially speaking right now to join that community. All right, we're back. I buried the lead a little bit, and I'm going to do listeners a solid and put in the show notes where we start this segment because I know many people want to hear um, my resident uh, British citizen talk about uh, Harry and Meghan, late Queen's passing, mm-hmm. and all the um, just all the stuff, man, that's going on going on with them i've got tons of thoughts mm-hmm. i know you you do too and i think this will be kind of fun let's i, I wanted yeah, this to be fun. on the back end because i think it'll be you know it's serious stuff but it will be a little more mm-hmm. lighthearted. but first um did i hear coda over there oh she is she right there hey. she's sleeping a word from our sponsors um our newly established patreon don't forget to check it out. Racially speaking, uh, or Patreon slash racially speaking, I believe is the URL. If you want to help us uh, get shows out quicker and most of all, help provide finances for um, or provide textbooks for students of color, college students of color, please join for as low as $1 a month on our Patreon page. And you get most of our episodes full video on the Patreon website. So go check that out. And you could see Coda, which I'm looking at. She's a beautiful puppy right now. Yeah. Sam's puppy. <laughs> you can get some puppy time if that's what you're if that's what you're uh, feeling. Um so go check it out. Oh look at the big yawn from Coda. <laughs> this is amazing. You're down now. Segment's over. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks for the uh the commercial, yeah. Sam. All right, let's jump into this, man. Um, yeah. There's so many things to talk about with um, it. What do they call it? The Brexit? 
Oh, Brexit? Um, like in terms of Harry and Meghan or Brexit itself? I don't, I don't even know. I just saw that. So I just showed how little I know. All right, let's start here. So the more serious thing is um, the wait. Queen Elizabeth's passing. How mm-hmm. long has it been now? Um, four, wasn't it? Um, right. So, I don't, four months, it, five months? Yeah, it was either September, September, October. Yeah. Anyway, uh, um, Queen passed. Yeah. Lived a long, long life. Mm-hmm. Um, your thoughts first, actually, we talked about this off mic, but uh, for, for listeners, uh, that have I told you that half of my, uh, my my mother's side of the family are all British, so I've got British roots, <laughs> yeah. Uh, which, yeah, I don't talk about a ton, um, not intentionally, just doesn't come up, but uh, anyway, so that informs a little bit of where I'm coming from with some of what we'll talk about. But thoughts, your thoughts and feelings. Um, as a citizen of the UK, um, on Queen Elizabeth's passing. Yeah. Um, so the BBC bulletin came out that, um, the queen was unwell and she was up in Scotland. Um, and that when, and that the family were coming in. Right. So normally or historically, when the BBC makes a statement like that, it's serious. Mm. Right? Like it is like she was going to die when they said that. Basically, when they, when they're, so when you, that bulletin, you when put that bulletin together. Came, yeah. And I was speaking with my dad and he was like, yeah, when they make a statement that the Queen's unwell or the monarch's unwell, it means that it's really serious. So, mm. and then days later, or it might have even been less, it might have been within the same day that they announced that she died. And I was sad, but I was sad. Like, I was yeah. like, my first reaction was like, I felt sad, right? Like I kind of, yeah, a sense of mourning. Like I've, my whole life, sure. she has been queen. I'm by no means a monarchist or like super into the royal family. Honestly, most Americans are more into the royal family. Than, <laughs> than, than, I bet. <laughs> Then the majority, well, not the majority of people in England, but uh, the pop culture side, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, but I was sad um, about when the Queen died. Um, yeah, but immediately following it, um, when I was seeing on social media people posting pretty horrible things, like "I'm glad she's dead." Uh, the mm. colonial oppressor is dead, like pictures where they'd photoshopped her face to make her look like a kind of like demonic. Oh, um, gosh. Even someone like this is like from anyway. Yeah. And I even got into it. Someone in, in DMs of like, I understand, right. She is the face of colonialism. Um, mm-hmm. She's on all the money. She was the figurehead. However, she's just died. Um, right. So there was, there's tension there for me because um studying what I study and and looking at post-colonial and the impacts of like, I'm not someone who is going to defend the British empire, right? Mm -hmm. Like India, um, all of the, we now label it as the Commonwealth, right? The, um, yeah, which is romanticized. We have the Commonwealth games, um, all of these countries that were part of the British empire. Um, like we, should not have really been there right like the british rule in india mm-hmm. was so messed up the amount of people that got displaced because of the partition of india and what is now pakistan right um and i get into this with my family members when i go home I, who are kind of imperialist like proud uh, <laughs> and speak highly okay. of you know yeah. british rule etc um me, me too yeah yeah I mean, but there's, legitimately, there's, yeah there's it's it's tension filled right it's she she ruled with the grace and, and decorum for 70 years. Um, but at the same time, she was the figurehead of kind of a lot of bad stuff that happened. Um, yeah. Whether that was up to her, pers- like, you know, her personally. And sure, a lot of under her reign, a lot of it, all of these countries became independent. Um, so, but generally speaking, I was sad when she died. Mm. Uh, and um 
but I can understand at the same time why people were not happy, but were bringing up the fact that, right, she was not just like mm. completely innocent. Right. Um, yeah. I think, I think we probably see almost completely eye to eye with, with all of this. Um, absolutely. Very much on the side of, you know, do we, we don't need to speak ill of the dead, especially no. right away. Yeah. However, I think I share your same feelings of, I'm not going to defend. No. I'm not going to hate on people that do feel that way. Because like you said, she's, and I think it's fair to critique her because she was the face of, you know, yeah. oppression for a lot of people yeah, absolutely. and colonization. Yeah. And whether, you know, you, we can have the conversations about how much was she directly responsible for or, or not, it, you know, that's fair to ask, but it's also doesn't matter to the people that were affected. People don't realize because it's like, well, she's still the face that comes with leadership and symbolism, even if it's just yeah. a symbol. Um, and so obviously in her later years, she was less responsible for a lot of things. Um, which we'll get to also in a second, but yeah, I mean, I read, uh, I read a good amount of stuff about, about it. And I'm by no means a history buff, but you know, read at one point, like if it was a third, maybe it's a quarter of, of the world at one point was colonized under British, you know, the British empire. So it's just like, yeah, people can feel how they feel in my opinion. And you know, they, there's, there's gotta be, nuance to it but i'm not going to hate on an entire people group for yeah. celebrating i don't mean disrespectfully or irreverently celebrating but feeling like a weight was lifted um yeah when she passed like i i, I understand what you know oh i shouldn't say i completely i understand but like i get what what is going on there yeah. and i i listened to something uh Trevor Noah said, which I think he actually, you know, people think what you want, but I think he said a, a few things that, were how, that I thought just made sense. And he was just like, you can't expect people to now respect somebody that never respected them. And I yeah. think that's putting it lightly. It was beyond not respecting. It was, you know, yeah. it was colonization, displacement, yeah. all like history. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think we probably see eye to eye on the nuance with feeling after someone like Queen Elizabeth passes. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was great. So, all right, moving on to the juicier stuff that I think people would will want us to talk about. So, all right, um, Prince Harry, yeah, and Meghan. Mm -hmm. This what was the word he used? It's not applied the same way, but this um, they well they disengaged, they exited, disengaged, right? exited yeah. from um, disidentified. Yeah, cut their ties. Yeah left royalty essentially um but, i mean they did that a while ago right this is right. a new thing they this isn't moved to california or wherever it they moved like over a year ago yeah wasn't it? yep but are obviously getting a lot of attention right now with the documentary harry mm -hmm. and megan on netflix if you haven't watched that um spare harry's book that just came out um they did the oprah interview last year um, which was shortly after they moved. Um, and obviously it's been in the headlines and news for a while. So a lot, we're not going to cover this um, extensively, um, but want to talk a little bit about it. So what are your thoughts on this happening? Cause like you said, you, you know, you said you're not a monarchist. Yeah. You can see the in-between of what's going on, but there's a lot of feelings, man, about mm -hmm. this happening, whether it's being just, it's selfish or disrespectful to the crown. It's selfish on Megan's part, I think is, is a one side of it, a big narrative. And then, um, but the other side is, you know, she was essentially experiencing abuse and yeah. not, not physical, but, um, and was mentally unstable. And then Harry, his growth journey through understanding her experience led them to literally leave. Um, and it didn't come easily. They didn't just, if you've watched or read anything about it, it wasn't just, all right, we got a piece out of here. It was like, they had to like fight their way out. 
Um, lots of stuff to talk about, but what overall have, has been your feelings throughout following that? Yeah. Their story. Harry, Prince Harry has always been my favorite, one of my favorite, my favorite royal. He's rebellious, right? He, okay. even as, as a teenager, like as a kid, old ladies would come up to me and say, oh, don't you look like Prince Harry, right? And like pat me on the head, right? So mm. maybe it's because I've read, I've read, facial, you know, whatever. So I've always been drawn to Prince Harry. Um, Meghan Markle, I came to know through the TV show Suits, right? So I knew okay. that's kind of, and then they got together and it was, you know, dream wedding and everything. Yeah. Um, but something that is, I think is important contextually to understand in terms of an American marrying into the royal family. Yeah, the give it to time, us. The only other time this, this happened was the Queen's uncle, okay, who was a king, King Edward VIII, wanted to marry Wallace Simpson, who um, was a, an American socialite who was divorced. And he wanted to marry her. And even worse, they used to run run in Nazi circles. They went on, went on a Nazi tour in 1937. Okay. Mm. Edward, the queen became queen because her uncle abdicated. Because the, the royal family would not let him marry Wallace Simpson, who is an American divorcee. Okay. Wow. So, okay. Um, so that's, that's in, I think that's important to this. Sure. Because, um she was a white woman wallace simpson but um spelled w-a-l-l-i-s simpson um so when edward abdicated that means the queen's father became king right so then that's how she ended up following on from her father so the queen's the queen's dad was not supposed to be king it was his brother he watched the king's speech or movies okay. or or on if you watch the crown this is also um kind of explicated so then so the track record of americans trying to marry into the royal family is not good to begin with um okay, so yeah. a, right um and then um megan as as um mixed race or biracial right adds, adds another layer something else that is really important is the press in england and th if you've watched the netflix documentary that was uh, just that was nuts to me the I had press. no idea yeah. it was that. I mean, I had no idea it was that on that level. Yeah. Um, so you, and you that it was think. that calculated. Yeah, you have to think, right? The, the United Kingdom is an island, right? With probably close to 70 million people in it, right? 60, mm. 60 70 million ballpark. <laughs> um, so that is a heck of a lot of people in this, in this tiny space, right? Yes. So everyone is in everyone's stuff all the time. So the tabloid mm -hmm. press, the tabloid press, which is kind of like where the paparazzi, you know, um, they're always in. And as the royals are always in the public eye, they're always and have always been in everything, especially, you know, Diana, if you think about um, Harry's mum, right? The princess Diana. Yeah. Um, but that that's not just the royals. It's everyone. It's always, you know, what footballers has been cheating on his wife with who other footballer or, you know, it's always, it's, it's always in everyone. If you're in the public eye, you have the tabloid press. Yeah. There. To me, to me, I didn't, not just, I didn't just not understand how pervasive it was for the individuals being covered, but it seemed like it was, this, is this true in your opinion? Like it, I couldn't get past the agreed upon or the agreement that there was between what it seemed to be the Royals and yeah. the press of like, you do this for us or like you give us pictures and time mm -hmm. and we keep letting you essentially rule. Like to me, that was just wild. I was like, what kind of, yeah. it's weird, isn't it? uh, like yeah. it was just so strange that everyone was aware that that was what it was. And to transition to like Meghan Markle's take, obviously Harry knew about that, but to Meghan Markle's take on how that, that that was kind of not kind of but was the catalyst for yeah them leaving of just her just being so caught off guard which i think harry should take some responsibility for that yeah but, uh, how off guard she was caught by some stuff but um anyway that that was just shocking to me of how that, that was just allowed to continue mm -hmm. to preserve the 
royal family. Yeah. Essentially. And I just, to me, it was like, is this a, I knew it wasn't, but it was like, is this a joke? Like, is it's that calculated? Like everyone knows that there's yeah. this agreement. Like we come out, shake hands, da da da, and we get to keep being right ruling like you owe it to us to show us like princess diana is like you owe it to us to show us your baby and yeah, yeah. stuff like that and i was just like why like what is happening um that was yeah. wild to me it's and i mean that's part of the one of the lines of argument is right megan should have known that yeah that she should have known into right how can you be naive in that way yeah um maybe is one one line of and do i think that she wasn't maybe she was somewhat aware but didn't really know what she was getting herself into i think that's probably some of it right uh, is that fair so like where do you i mean i think i kind of understand where you're probably coming from but how about people listening so like do you think the claims from megan and harry specifically like are valid i don't just mean like oh good point but i mean do you like it i think people are taking this a little too lightheartedly in my opinion of like oh well there was a disagreement they mm-hmm. left like she was she was selfish or I, I don't know i to me i'm like yeah no this is this was serious like to and it's a documentary it's articles and stuff like i don't i can never truly know especially not ever truly know somebody i don't know mm-hmm. But to me, I just can't, I think there's enough information in my opinion out there that, sh- that I don't know why you wouldn't believe yeah. Megan and Harry for the most part. Mm-hmm. You know what I, I mean? Like, I don't know how you can err on the side of, I truly don't. Like, I'm not saying that to, you no know, looking for pushback from anybody listening, but like, I can't, I don't know how you land completely on the side of, oh, they made this up. It's selfish and disrespectful. I don't believe, I don't believe- and I think the big question is, are the royal family racists, right? Right. right. And there's, and to me, like the fact that that's a big question, but it's also a subtle question, like in the documentary, like that wasn't like the big focus. It was just like, it was, you got to see Harry's realization of, well, you know, I went down this road, bringing stuff up of why I thought that Megan needed to be protected more and the, all the different you know, strings he tried to pull and then he finally came down to him. And I love the scene where he, you kind of just see him realize, and it's not even a direct question. He's just like, it was the racial element that they weren't touching on or getting, getting across or being able to get by. And to me, yeah, to, like, that's obviously what's why I want to ask you on this podcast specifically, but like, that's a big element to it that I, I don't know. I think it, it's just an interesting thing. Yeah. I think it says a lot about you, not just you, but everyone listening, like, or that's kept up with the story on where you're at with some of these things that we're discussing on what you think about what's going on. I don't mean that in a condemning way. I just mean like, I, I, what danger is there to believe someone's story of pain and abuse? Mm-hmm. Like if they're lying, like then there's going to be some ramifications when that comes out. I just don't know yeah. why you would land on the side of they're just lying. Um, yeah, I, I think that I think something. Do I think they experienced explicit racism, Megan specifically, and maybe their kid, one of their children? Um, is it Archie? I think one of them is called Archie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when he was born, do I think that they experienced explicit? They definitely ex- experienced some some abuse. Do I think that the people, the Queen or King Charles now, right, or William, Kate, are explicit racists? I don't know. I, I don't know. Mm. I don't know. Is the institution that it's founded upon historically racist? Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Like, with the colonial history, like, I don't know, there was a story that came out recently of some lady who was wearing, like, a brooch of, like, a... Um, an yeah, that's in the, lady, right? Yeah, like, that was in the dark. Yeah, um, right. That that was in it, right? So there's this just un there's just that history of the institution being completely white, being the the colonial oppressors, right? And then all of a sudden you have an American biracial actress come into the picture who's gonna, you know, shake that that puppy up. <laughs> right Mm. for um and i think she she the institution and just the history of it all she 
didn't realize how powerful that was. And I think the abuse and the implicit racism that she experienced because of that and potentially explicitly, I I, I don't know. Yeah. Um, really led to, to, you know, her decline in mental health um, or her not decline in mental health, but her the sh- mental health uh, battles that she, she faced and probably continues to face is, is all tied up into that. I think. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I think it's pretty clear that she experienced explicit racism, not directly from, at least Harry wasn't saying not directly from, you know, the family, but to me it was that, I, you know, she had experienced explicit racism by the hands of, you know, paparazzi. Oh and, yeah. By the press and, and by citizens. The press, 100%, yeah. So mm-hmm. then the interconnectedness to me is then when they requested protection and for help that wasn't given. In fact, there's that one part. And again, if they're making this all up, fine. But then we're never, you know, well, I believe anything if they're making it up. So I'll just say this, like, if this is true, um, they are, the part there that stuck out to me with the race, the race element, you know, they're bringing that to security and to the family and saying, Hey, we need like, what are we going to do about this? We need some yeah. protection or we need you to stick up for us because they're publishing lies about us. The fact that that wasn't given tells says a lot. And mm-hmm. I think Harry's perspective on that, he picked up on that because there's the yeah. racial element because they, it was, it was pitting her against Kate and I, to me, it sounds like those the two women had a decent relationship even, but it was pitting them against each other in a sense of like they were um, willing to let the press um, d- defame her character, Meghan Markle's character, um, and let that distract everybody from something yeah. else that Kate was going through, Kate and William, um, mm-hmm. which whatever that was, I heard it was, you know, infidelity, stuff like that. But whatever it was, they were willing to let Meghan Markle take the abuse if it kept every, the other stories um, close to the chest. And so to me, I picked up on that as a viewer and a follower, but then it was also stuck out to me that Harry, that was a big turning point for Harry. I thought of like, mm-hmm. okay, we need to, we need to do something with, they are not going to help us. My own family is yeah. not going to help us. And I think people also, tend to take it a little too lightly that like, okay, if you're not believing anything they're saying, you're purely believing that they're chasing fame um, and money. To me, that just, that doesn't add up. They're already famous. They already have money and he's leaving his family. Like mm-hmm. in some, in, in some ways he's leaving the family, like the Royal family. Like I, I can you imagine how painful it would be to leave your whole family and country and ever, like, because of, betrayal from your own family and culture like that's yeah. like yeah i can understand that on a tiny scale but like the fact that like people are just attributing this to um you know selfishness <laughs> do think that money do you, i'll push back a little bit do you not think yeah, that money do it. played any like i had sympathy for them and then i watched the netflix documentary and I was like, you want privacy and you've released this. It, okay, didn't, yeah. make, it didn't make sense to me. It, it was like, you're complaining about paparazzi and then you've just released a, a Netflix documentary and released a book. Sure, you want to share your story and I believe you, but there's something else there as well. I think, yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because that is, uh, so, okay. I must say I'm not biased at all, but I think to me, we've touched on the paparazzi I don't, I don't think wanting privacy and somebody of their stature mm. uh, and somebody of their stature's viewpoint is the same as like, no. you know, you or I. So like they no. didn't want to be abused by the paparazzi. We've already unpacked how mm. toxic it was. Like it was like a, they responsible for Diana's death. Like they are toxic to the maximum level death. Mm. Like they'll, they will paparazzi you to death. Like yeah. literally. Yeah. And so, and they were on the heels of feeling like that's getting ready to happen to us. Mm-hmm. Like it wasn't, Oh, this isn't working out. We need to get out of here. It was yeah. like, we, we can't like, we're going to die. Yeah. There's like she can't, she even yeah. contemplated suicide, stuff like that. Like, and again, people want to not believe that it is what it is. But like, so to me, they wanted privacy in the sense of, we don't want to be in the Royal family anymore. 
so they're always going to be famous. Like they can't, they're just on another level. And I, they, I feel like for them, you know, peeling back is getting away from that. Like they're never going to be, unless they go off and like, which they did for a while and seclude and never see anybody else again. Like they're always going to be in the public eye, Yeah. but that's nothing over here. Like, as I saw in the doc, like compared to British yeah. paparazzi, especially being a royal family. So like to me, yeah, am I weary of doc documentaries that are, you know, produced and only done by the people in them? Like, sure. Like, do I like is everything in that one hundred and thousand percent true? Like probably probably not. Like, is it skewed to make them look good? Absolutely. But I don't think it means that all of it is just, oh, you guys just wanted to be yeah, no, Amer- not- American yeah. famous type thing. So like to me, I'm just in the camp of they wanted to tell their story mm-hmm. because of how much abuse they've taken and how many false things I think to the level that no one, none of us can imagine have been put out there about them. Um, yeah. So they wanted to s- straighten some things out. I think knowing that people are not, everyone's not going to believe them or be on board. Yeah. I-, I don't know. And to me, I don't have a problem necessarily with that. They're, sharing stuff and doing their advocacy over here i don't know i think my pushback to that would be like what do you what should they do yeah um yeah. i do see the point like i see it like yes it does oh they're just doing stuff now that makes them more famous but i think it's yeah i don't know i just can't get yeah. past i feel like harry and megan especially harry would have much preferred not to have to gone to this point and now he's just living his life and mm-hmm. they're famous. Yeah. So I, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I agree with you and I, and, and I understand. And when they first moved to the States, I was like, good. They needed to get out of there. They needed that separation. Mm-hmm. They needed to get, and they were still hounded by the paparazzi here. There's that. Right. In the documentary of the people on the boats trying to look into their house. Yeah. Awful. Or terrible. Right. I yeah. loved, it was really moving to see Tyler Perry's relationship with them. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was great. And I thought it was powerful that he, as a black man, had already reached out and early on could kind of, was just a very fatherly person to her from the beginning before he knew any of this would happen. Like he didn't, no one thought this would happen. He just knew that, okay, she's going to experience some stuff, whatever that is. Like there's going to be some cultural stuff that she's going to have to endure and experience once she's married and I'm going to be here for her if she needs me. And I don't think he imagined it'd be on this level by any means, but, um, I thought that was really, really powerful. Serena as well. Serena. Yeah. Yeah. Being Serena, being one of our good friends. Um, I thought that was cool as well. Like I have mad respect for respect for, for Serena for, you know, for everything that she's accomplished and what she stands for. Absolutely. And I just think with Megan, um, I think the energy and manipulation it would have have to take for her to be purely making even half of this stuff up would be so difficult. I'm not saying people aren't capable of some really terrible things, but it would have to be elaborate. And it just seemed like like she would have had to fake the whole yeah i don't think she's i don't think she the whole desire to have a family i don't know i don't think she fakes any of it in there but she's a very good actress like (laughs) (laughs) i don't know when i watched it when i was watching it i was like i agree like how you have been treated is horrific i don't know The, the 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 yeah I'm torn. I'm at, I'm like, I, I, and this, I, who am I right to say that you're, you're hamming this up or just doing it for the money? Cause that's not all that I'm saying. I think they've probably made a lot of money from, from, sure. from that Netflix documentary and probably from the book. And it's, yeah. And it's how they, how they have been treated and how, is there is no, um, you can't like justify that whatsoever. It is horrific. So it's, yeah, I, it's a tough one and I support them. But at the same time, I was a bit, I when I went after I'd watched the documentary, I was like, 
okay what's kind of yeah. like your, what was the end goal here like are you just trying to share your story yeah i don't know i just think it could be relatable yeah. to anybody that's gotten away from a bad situation whether it's on an abusive level or just something that was unpleasant even and especially if a false story or narrative is the common belief about you or why you left or yeah, straight. Yeah, that makes anything sense. in between. It's just, to me, it's human and it's, and they are on the highest level possible. So we can't relate to that. But to me, yeah. I'm just like, I, 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 you can't expect somebody to like leaving a place, but not being able to share the full story feels really terrible. Yeah. From their perspective, that was the, one of the opening lines, wasn't it? It was yeah. like, this is our story who people keep saying, um, talking about us here it is from the horse's mouth this is what happened right like right and that's what that's how they opened some of the we're going to share it from from our perspective and i really did i do appreciate that and um so yeah maybe i'm being too too critical from from because i mean they're royal like they Mm -hmm. are in positions of ultimate privilege yeah I don't know how they would leave just a completely quiet life. Could they have not done a Netflix documentary? Maybe. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. That's fair. Like it's fair to say, yeah, they could have not done that and done something else. They're not hurting for money. Um, I just think there's a side to it of, I think it's, I think that part, actually the conversation could be a little like two different conversations more of like, Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's purely motivated by money. Did they make money off it? Uh, yeah, of course they did. But does that mean that's the only reason they did it? Not at all. Absolutely yeah. not. Um, so anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. And I think that with her, yeah. her identity, we're getting off track, but like her identity as a mixed race woman and her, her perspective was interesting, even on her own identity. Cause you kind of, that's another thing that I feel like actually helps. Um, I don't want to say argument, but my perspective is like, she, it's not like she came into the Royal family thinking like, all right, I'm going to wreck stuff. Cause I'm a black woman. She's like, she came into her racial yeah. consciousness throughout the process of like, yeah. because of racism. And that's, I think more common than a lot of people think. She's like, I never, I'm very light skinned. I've never identified like, or experienced, you know, I've never heard the N word. My mom's heard it, but I haven't. And she never experienced explicit racism that she knows of Mm. and stuff like that. She was just identified as white it for most of her life. And so like, she had to start identifying and taking pride in her mixed race and black identity because that's what people were labeling her as. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. She did that, but I'm saying like she was empowered slash marginalized at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Because of the whole racism Mm -hmm. thing. And so she's like, Oh, I, this is powerful to me that black citizens in the UK see me as representative of them. Like we talk about representation on here a lot of how powerful that is. It's not just a hold your hands and kumbaya thing. Like we want, you know, yeah, be just so can, yeah. Up there. it's like no it's powerful people are empowered when they get represented for the first time and so i think that was really powerful to see her tap into that and when she tapped it like i feel like the timing of that to me speaks volumes about okay this really wasn't her intention but now mm-hmm. she's leaning into it because it's like oh i this is a great opportunity to help people yeah um yeah, it's, I, I it was, um, it's, yeah. Go ahead. The interviews, you know, when 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 the, the, there were interviews, right, with um, members of the British public, right, um, mm-hmm. um, specifically people of color, right, and they were like, "This is great. We have, you know, yeah. a black woman in Buckingham Palace who is a member of like we are. This is and like absolutely right, especially given you know the colonial." history that we've already talked upon like it was huge but i don't think megan was megan had no idea what that the impact that that was going to have given Mm. given the institution that is the royal family yeah yeah um i want to honor your time but i mean kind of the last thing i'll say on this is like i mentioned even my family and um so my, on my mom's side, so my mom, shout out to my mom. She's biggest supporter of the podcast. Yeah. Um, 
listening right now, I'm sure. But, um, you know, aside from her, a lot of my extended family who will never don't even know this exists or will never listen. Um, I, I sensed a little, I could identify and resonate with some of what Megan was going through on an obviously super tiny scale. But as you mentioned, you're, you're not a monarchist or anything like that, but in that part of my family, that's very much the, uh, the sentiment is very much the queen could do no wrong. The royals could do no wrong in that they're very much on the side of, and I've heard this from, you know, several other people of like, almost like a shame on Harry and Meghan perspective. How dare they time and time. So like, that's just experiencing that on a minuscule scale and, and resonating with it and or linking that to what things Meghan was bringing up. I just, that's a personal thing for me of like, I just, it's hard not to believe what she's talking about. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mentioned, you know, that side of my family is British and, um, yeah, very, very, very British. I don't know how else to say it, but like, I mean, that was, if anything, one of the biggest cultures that formed a lot of my upbringing even. Um, and so like, I, I could kind of, as this was coming out, see a lot of comparisons and whatnot. So it's not just by a loose extension, you know, my family, grandma still goes over to England all the time. And I don't even notice, but like, if my friends growing up were to meet my grandma, like, oh, she's, oh, she's got an accent. She's British. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. <laughs> Um, anyway, yeah. Um, look, man, this is, uh, it has been great. I appreciate yeah. your time and your busy, uh, studies or PhD life. How much longer do you have? Three more semesters, Lord willing. Um, okay. yeah. So expected graduation is, uh, spring 24. Okay. So, well, congrats, yeah. man. This is, you obviously are, um, I think, uh, a, really powerful voice and important perspective in academia um in general you're doing some you're doing some really cool work um i'm definitely going to keep using you as a personal resource (laughs) um absolutely um, yeah i've been really really fortunate um to uh, it's been it's been hard but i'm so fortunate to have been given the opportunities you know through Radford and being able to study and even be here, right, is um has been a huge blessing. So yeah. Thanks for having me, David. It's been really meaningful. And yeah, I think we've had so hopefully a good, meaningful conversation that people can hopefully chew on and disagree with and agree yeah, with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Are they gonna um hire you back down here in the NRV when you're done? <laughs> oh, there is thought. There's a thought that we I've been in the States for nine years now. Um, yeah 2014 to 2023 so um there's a thought of us maybe going across the pond and seeing what it looks like to live there all right we'll see what happens with jobs so um, okay emily is uh, your wife is the Mm -hmm. social media person right she's who i should talk to yeah so she's she works in corporate um social media uh for uh, company called Lumen. If any Seahawks fans, Lumen Field. Um, Lumen is a tech company. So she, no, wait. Uh, Lumen, like L-U-M-O-N? L-U-M-E-N. E-N, okay. I don't follow football a, m- a lot, so I didn't know. That's Is that what the field's name? Is that what you said? Yeah, so the Seahawks field is named Lumen Field. Okay, so, so I'm sure most people them. connected that, but I we just got done watching Severance, and that's – have you watched Severance? No, but isn't I think a lot of people tell her about that because isn't that L U M I N or it's O? I think it's O N, but yeah, um, that's all I'll say about that. You should watch it. Is it Apple TV? Is it Apple TV or yeah, crazy show? Yeah, Apple. Okay, um, yeah, that's immediately what I thought of is Lumen. I'm like, tech company Lumen, what? And you'll get you'll get what I'm talking about if you watch the show, it'll be be really eerie. Some other friends have recommended it to me. Maybe Emily shouldn't watch it to be honest. (laughs) i'll I'll, I'll tell her that anyway all right again thanks so much sam uh listeners thank you as always for for checking us out um the music you're listening to is done by our friend dylan dent and our artwork was created by ashley bush and we'll see you guys next time don't forget to check out our patreon we'll see you guys next time 
The nightmare might scare you No worse than reality They hunt you by day Y'all rob here my hard arbory. Everybody got a time But that's less than comforting I hope I'm alive by the time They choose to come for me Mosquitoes in the vein Or leeches on my soul This money on my mind Is a fracture of my bones You get crippled by continuing existence Like a ghost And they wonder why we drink And they wonder why we smoke And they wonder why we think That everything's a joke I'm shocked that we can sleep Must be the thought of letting go Now I lay me down to see if I'm better with the valley